Hello and welcome to this episode of Quality of Life. Today's subject, we are going to be dealing with the cardiovascular system. And helping us discuss that, that um, part of the body is Dr. Robert Horth from Coolest Cardiology. Dr. Horth, welcome to the show. Oh, well, thanks for having me. Um, just to start out with, what is your background in cardiology, you know, education and what you do now? Okay, um, I uh, went to college at a school called King's College, which is in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. It's a sister school to Notre Dame. And then I went to medical school at the University of Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I then did my internal medicine residency at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and then I did my cardiology fellowship at the University of Miami. Um, I then went forward with all of my board certification mm -hmm. exams and am board certified in internal medicine, cardiology, nuclear cardiology, cardiac CT, and echocardiography. Um, I, uh, uh, after fellowship, was in practice out in Los Angeles, California uh, for about uh, six years. And, ha um, uh, and my family, we relocated here uh, about four and a half years ago mm -hmm. from Los Angeles. Okay. I suppose that was a big culture change. Yeah, but I think for, you know, as a guy who's originally from Pennsylvania, this is a lot more okay. what I was accustomed to, for okay. sure. Okay. Um, the cardiovascular system, can mm -hmm. you give us just briefly what is it and why it's so important to the body? Um, well, um, as a cardiovascular specialist, uh, you're dealing with, obviously, the heart. Um, uh, anatomically, the chambers of the heart, the atria, the ventricles, the valves of the heart. The circulation around the heart, the coronary, which are called the coronary arteries. You're also dealing with the main arteries and veins that leave the heart, the pulmonary arteries, the pulmonary veins. The main artery that leaves the heart is called the aorta. That uh, then will separate into your carotid arteries, your subclavian, which go to your shoulders and to the rest of your body. So when, when most people speak of cardiovascular, it's mainly the heart and then the arterial system of the body. Okay. What are the major types of heart disease? Um, today. Well, I mean, obviously, probably what's most prominent and prevalent in the population is coronary artery disease would be number one. Mm -hmm. um, so if you looked at, you know, um, and along with coronary artery disease, I guess we'll be also talking about stroke, and a lot of them have mm -hmm. a lot of common risk factors together. Okay. Um, but we also can deal with congenital problems of the heart. Um, so some people can be born with holes in their heart, abnormal heart valves. Um, sometimes these things can lead to arrhythmias, heart failure. As cardiologists, we also deal with the electrical system of the heart, so arrhythmias, different mm -hmm. types of abnormal heart rhythms. Okay. Um, one of the things that you hear common is what they call the widow maker. Mm -hmm. What is the widow maker? Well, um, you know, a lot of times patients, you know, will say um, that's usually going to be defined when a cardiac catheterization, which a cardiac catheterization is where we um, go through either the main artery in the leg or in the wrist, we go up to the heart, and then we inject dye into the arteries around the heart. For most patients, um, you have two main left coronary arteries, but it starts with one main left coronary artery, and that supplies the whole left side of the heart. If there's a blockage in what's called the left main coronary artery, if that blocks, the whole left side of the heart would die, and that's, that's lethal. So that's okay. what's referred to as the widow maker. widow maker, okay. Um, are people born with these types of conditions which, you know, lead to the heart disease or does it happen over time? Well, I, I mean, when you speak of heart disease, I don't know if you're speaking of like coronary artery disease. Sure. Okay. Well, That's you know, fair. interestingly, um, you know, when you look at most patients having heart attacks, you're seeing that um, starting to manifest itself in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. But they did a very interesting study in the Vietnam era where they did autopsies on some of the young men um, that died over in Vietnam, and they actually found that the beginnings of atherosclerosis or buildup of, of plaque in the coronaries mm -hmm. actually begins um, in, and they found in these young men, 18, 19 years old. What they've actually found now with the epidemic of diabetes is that now what they're finding is in young children that are developing diabetes at a young age that they actually are starting to develop um, what's called fatty streaks in the mm -hmm. coronary arteries. Well, it's kind of like, so the heart attack is kind of like the proverbial iceberg, but the blockage in the coronary artery, it's gradually manifesting itself, getting bigger and bigger, and then the heart attack usually is going to occur later in life. So the problem didn't actually occur on the night of the heart attack. Okay. It probably started 50 to 60 years okay. earlier. Okay. So basically what it sounds like you're saying is basically anybody could develop a heart condition over 
time? Well, I mean, anyone can, but there are, there are standard risks for heart disease. Okay. Um, we usually refer to what are called the big five, which would be high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, smoking, and family history. Um, so if there's a strong family history, you're genetically predisposed to coronary artery disease. Diabetes. Diabetes is a huge risk factor for heart disease. It is assumed, a diabetic is assumed to have some degree of coronary artery disease before anything else uh, would be present. A diabetic is as likely to have their first heart attack as someone who's had their first heart attack having a second heart attack. Um, so if I have a patient who their father had a heart attack in his 50s. Is that patient more predisposed to having a heart, a heart attack than someone that there's no family history? Absolutely. That being said, are there patients where there's no family history of coronary disease and then all of a sudden they have a heart attack mm -hmm. in their 50s? The answer is yes. But for most of us, you know, if you look, most patients that are going to end up presenting with coronary disease are gonna have one or multiple of those big five risk factors. Okay. By diabetes, is it type 1 and type 2, or is one more prone than the other? Well, I mean, when you look at the overall prevalence of diabetes, um, type 2 diabetes or adult onset diabetes is much more prevalent than type 1. Type 1 diabetes is caused by a failure of the pancreas to produce sure. insulin, and that's called juvenile onset diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is adult onset diabetes. Now, interestingly, with the obesity epidemic, um, in our country at this point, we're actually getting type 2 diabetics occurring in children, in, you know, 8, 9, 10 years old. Um, so to answer your question, you know, now if mm -hmm. a type 1 diabetic, yes, they're going to be much more likely to develop coronary disease because they're, they had diabetes at a younger age. And okay. that diabetes is going to start working on all the arteries in their body, including the arteries around their heart. Okay. Well, I'd probably make a good try to end commercial because four out of five, <laughs> I don't smoke, so at least I got yeah. that going for me. Okay. So, but anyway, um, so if somebody is, you know, a possible candidate of heart disease, what uh -huh. are the types of symptoms somebody should look for? Or well, I mean, when you read the textbook, you know, the classic symptoms would be chest discomfort. So, you know, the, you know classically a heaviness across the mm -hmm. chest and usually it would be with exertion. So like, you know, when you're going for a walk and you're walking up a hill getting chest discomfort that many will characterize as a heaviness. If it radiates to the neck or the jaw, the shoulder, down the arm. Um, uh, usually when, they, when a patient rests, that pain will go away. Now, interestingly, diabetics are much more likely to have atypical symptoms or no symptoms at all. And we're not really sure why that is. Mm -hmm. Now, with, along with diabetes, you can get vascular disease. You can get something called peripheral neuropathy, which is abnormal nerve conduction. And they think that potentially, because of the neuropathy, that maybe the pain fibers going to the heart are somewhat disturbed. Because uh, at least 50% of patients, their first manifestation of heart disease is having a heart attack. Mm -hmm. But again, classically, the heaviness across the chest with exertion, shortness of breath, um, waking up at night, short of breath, those would be kind of classic symptoms of blocked arteries. Okay. Um, does stress play any factor into this? Well, um, you know, when you look at most heart attacks occur in the morning, but that's been tied to the fact that we have what are called adrenal glands, which are glands on top of our kidneys, and they secrete a hormone called cortisol. Our cortisol levels are highest in the morning, and that tends to elevate our blood sugar. And they think somehow that may destabilize plaque in your coronary arteries, which would, when those, those rupture, could make you prone to a heart attack. Um, so when we're under stress, it ends up that our blood pressure goes up, our heart rate goes up, and there are certain hormone levels that will go up, mm -hmm. and those can potentially be tied to future risk of heart attack. Now, the good news is, is there are certainly things that we can do to prevent a heart attack. Um, you know, there are certain things that we also cannot control. Like, we can't control genetics at this point in time, like what you inherited from your mom or your dad mm -hmm. or your ancestors. But we can exercise, and one of the most powerful um, things that we can do to prevent heart disease, a half an hour of exercise a day um, will decrease your risk of a heart attack or stroke potentially up to as much as 70%. Now, when we say exercise, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, going out and walking your dog and taking a leisurely pace. We're usually looking at getting our heart rate up to 220 minus our age, that quantity times 85%. So for, we'll say example, a 60-year-old patient, 
well, we'd want your heart rate to get to 220 minus 60, which would be 160 times 85%, so getting your heart rate imp into the 140s or so. Mm -hmm. So now with every patient, that's going to be different on the amount of exertion that you need. But usually sure. what I like to use as a standard benchmark for exercise for most patients is, you know, probably in a half an hour, be able to walk one and a half to two miles, which would be three to four miles an hour of walking. But a stationary bike, an elliptical, a treadmill, walking fast, swimming, all of those things are fine. Mm -hmm. Commonly, I'll have patients like, well, you know, I'm playing golf quite a bit. Well, that's being active, but not being cardiovascularly right. fit. The good news about the exercise is, studies have shown within two weeks of starting exercise, your risk goes down. Within two weeks of stopping, though, it goes away. Mm -hmm. Um, now, with exercise, our blood pressure will go down, our heart rate will go down, our cholesterol will go down, and our blood sugars will go down. So exercise would be one thing. The next thing, which is very difficult to do, potentially is weight loss. Yep. Um, getting back to diabetes and the big risk factors for heart disease, there's something called the metabolic syndrome. And what that is, is as we carry extra weight, blood pressure, cholesterol, and blood sugar all go up. So if we can reverse that trend and lose weight and exercise, cholesterol, blood pressure, and blood sugars will go down. Nice. I know with two of the things that you had mentioned with the blood sugars, you know, describing that with the adrenals and all that in the morning, that makes sense because whenever I check my blood sugars in the morning, it's like they're off the chart, but then as soon as mm -hmm. I get going inactive or later on, they come right back down. Um, that's true. And also, though, with some diabetics, it depends on the medications you're taking in the evening. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes with diabetic medication, if you take them in the evening, there's something called the Samoji effect, that if you actually take too much medicine, your body will rebound and have high sugars in the morning. Mm -hmm. But as you said, you know, your cortisol levels will be higher and that will drive your blood sugars up. Okay. The other thing I noticed, too, is I was a lot heavier than what I am now and I'm mm -hmm. actually about a little over a year ago I started and I'm uh -huh. actually creeping up on 45 pounds uh -huh. oh, of getting rid of, so it's working pretty well too. Sure, yep. And it's easier on the joints, walking and everything, you feel uh -huh. better and everything obviously, mm -hmm. so as far as that goes. With heart disease or, you know, a cardiac type of an incident or coming, is there a way they can detect it? You know, other than symptoms, if the, is there mm -hmm. tests they can run? You know, mm -hmm. if you say, if I got chest pains or whatever, I go mm -hmm. in, what are the certain tests they can run? Well, I mean, usually kind of the gold standard test is what's called an EKG or an electrocardiogram. And what we can do is um, they can put leads on your chest. We have 12 leads and it tells us electrically what's going on with the heart. And with the blocked artery, there will be electrical changes. So um, an EKG is usually pretty standard. There are blood tests that can be done. There's a uh, blood test called a troponin, which is a protein that we can detect in the blood. Mm -hmm. When heart muscle dies, it releases this protein into the blood, and when we check a blood test, we can detect that. Um, obviously, if patients had symptoms, a chest x-ray, again, the routine blood work, an EKG. Now, you know, what becomes somewhat controversial with medical care at this point is, well, if you have a patient that has a lot of risk, how can you look forward at preventing that problem in the future? Now, we talked about modification of risk. With exercise, blood sugars, cholesterol, and blood pressure will go down. Well, there are certainly medications mm -hmm. that can um, lower your blood pressure, medications that can lower your blood sugar, and medications that can um, uh, lower your cholesterol. Um, now, with cholesterol being very aggressive about keeping our cholesterol down, and in people who have diabetes or documented coronary artery disease, we want their LDL, or their bad cholesterol, mm -hmm. to be less than 70. Um, again, the exercise is going to be a strong proponent. There's something that, you know, a lot of the folks at home, if they wanted to, could go online and Google called a Framingham Risk Score. A Framingham Risk Score, you can type in your age, your cholesterol, your blood pressure, and whether you smoke, and it'll tell you what your 10-year aggregate risk is of having a heart attack. One of the other issues that we'll see on TV is people will say, should I be taking an aspirin a day? And the answer to that is, if you went under Framingham risk, and if your risk is intermediate to high, the answer is yes, you should be taking mm -hmm. probably a baby aspirin, an 81 milligram aspirin. So, but that doesn't mean everybody should be taking right. aspirin. Obviously, there are going to be exceptions. But again, you can go under and type in Framingham risk, and that'll kind of give you a global. Now, part of the Framingham risk, though, did not include other things like, as we said, diabetes. Um, and kind of getting back to, there really isn't a standard from the American College of Cardiology on, should I just go in for a stress test and see if everything is okay? Unfortunately, in this day and age, the answer to that would be no.
Right. Because I know I've had a couple stress tests just uh -huh. for routine, and then uh -huh. you do the nuke med scan with right. all of that. And right. Both times I've had false positives. Okay. So then they weren't sure is it or isn't it, so then uh -huh. they wound up, I wound up getting a heart cath. Okay. You know, both times, and then things were fine. Right. Well, you know, obviously with any testing, there are going to be technical limitations. Mm -hmm. Um, you're mentioning a nuclear stress test that tends to be our most accurate stress test. That being said, it has an accuracy of about 80 to 85 percent. Right. But there are other things that we can look at. Um, you know, when you look, there are new imaging modalities that have come out in the last probably 10 years. One is called cardiac MRI, one is called cardiac CT, where we can actually image the coronary sure. arteries. Now, when you look at the guidelines for using that type of technology, it's very limited and probably to consult your doctor, your cardiologist on whether that would apply to you or not. Sure. Is there or what is the relationship between, you know, strokes, because you're people having strokes and then obviously heart attacks or blockages, you know, mm -hmm. the, what is the relationship or which one will happen before the other or mm -hmm. I guess what triggers or how can each occur? Well, I mean, with a, with a stroke, there are different types of strokes. There's something called an embolic stroke, which means either a clot from the heart or a piece of plaque breaks off from your carotid arteries and goes to your brain. Um, there's something called an ischemic stroke, um, which could be any uh, interference with blood flow, low blood pressure could cause a stroke. Well, it ends up that if you have blocked arteries around your heart, that's usually an indicator that you probably have blocked arteries everywhere. Mm -hmm. Most commonly, the carotid arteries in our neck would be a source of stroke. And whenever someone has a stroke, there are standard things that we look at. One would be the carotids, the other would be an ultrasound of the heart to make sure there are no blockages. Usually when we start seeing plaque buildup in the carotid arteries, also patients that have that are more likely to have coronary artery disease because you have blockage here, it's probably there as well. Now, interestingly, your risk of stroke is much more highly correlated with blood pressure now, blood pressure is a risk factor for coronary disease, but it's much less than for stroke. So patients that are hypertensive or have high blood pressure, that's a huge predisposing factor, risk mm -hmm. factor for stroke. Um, now, again, smoking, diabetes, a lot of the risk factors for heart disease will carry into stroke. Um, and again, um, you know, modification of blood pressure, modification of cholesterol, lowering blood sugar, and aspirin a day, all of these mm -hmm. things would help prevent that from happening. Now, it, interestingly, with, with coronary artery disease, that is much more closely correlated with your cholesterol numbers. That being said, that having lower cholesterol will lower your risk of stroke, but not as substantially as risk of heart attack. Okay. Um, you had mentioned medications, obviously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, when does a physician usually put people on medications or start to, you know, saying, well, I think it's time you go on high blood pressure, it's time mm -hmm. you start doing diabetes, you know, mm -hmm. but I guess when does they start usually going on medications and then? Well, you know, I think it's kind of, you know, unfortunately it's not like a one-size-fits-all type right. of approach. It really kind of depends on the risk factors that you're bringing to the table. Again, a diabetic, it's assumed that that's what's called a coronary artery disease risk equivalent, meaning we assume that they have coronary disease. So the American College of Cardiology suggests that a diabetic should have an LDL or bad cholesterol less than 100, or there's the option that your cardiologist could make it less than 70 because those are high, they're considered very high risk. Now, if you had your standard patient, we'll say a 40-year-old male with no risk of coronary artery disease, an LDL cholesterol less than 160 is adequate. Um, and the more risk factors you have, it gets ratcheted down. So patients that have had bypass surgery, stents, or known coronary disease, or diabetes, in our practice, we try to maintain an LDL or bad cholesterol less mm -hmm. than 70. Getting to blood pressure. The standard lowering of blood pressure in all patients is around 140 over 90. Now that being said, in diabetics, we actually are shooting for lower blood pressure because the diabetes along with hypertension, can affect the kidneys and the rest of the vascular mm -hmm. system. So our goals and where we would implement medication kind of changes depending on the risk that you bring. So you may have a neighbor that, you know, the doctor's like, well, your LDL or bad cholesterol is 135 and he did nothing, but you could have your other neighbor who has mm -hmm. bypass surgery that they want the LDL cholesterol less than 70. Um, Certainly, once we know someone has coronary disease, we need to help prevent that from progressing further in the future. Interestingly, that when 
With diabetes, we look at something called the hemoglobin A1C, which tells us your average blood sugar over a 90-day period of time. Um, we usually shoot for the hemoglobin A1C to be less than seven, ideally getting as close to six as possible. Studies have shown that when it goes from seven to eight to nine to 10, that actually your risk for heart attack and stroke starts going up exponentially. So the implementation of medication is, to answer your question, mm -hmm. is going to really depend on the risk globally that the doctor is seeing in that individual patient. Yeah. Oh, I've always been a good one for going off the charts, so that's why I kind of went like this, because my A1C <laughs> yeah. it is kind of high, but yeah. it's, it's, I mean, we're getting it under control. Okay. So as long as that goes, um, as far as that. Um, you had mentioned, like, you know, the whole vascular system with the kidneys, you know, once in a while you hear people with, you know, blocked, where they have to put stents into the kidneys, does that play mm -hmm. into a role, or is that not a much factor? Yeah, it is. I mean, um, when you look, and that's called renal artery stenosis. Now, um, with diabetes, how it affects the kidneys is actually almost at a cellular level. The, the filtering unit of the kidney is called the glomerulus, and actually diabetes affects that. But diabetes can certainly cause blocked arteries going to the kidneys, and those are called your renal arteries. Now, usually signs of blocked kidney arteries would be high, high blood pressure that's recalcitrant to mm -hmm. any medications. Usually, when a patient's on three to four medications to control their blood pressure, it's something someone should think about. Could there be blockages to the arteries, to the kidneys? And the mm -hmm. reason why that happens is that the kidneys will secrete a hormone to raise your blood pressure. Because their blockage is going to the kidneys, the kidneys sense they're not getting enough blood, so then they secrete hormones to tell the body, increase the pressure to get me more blood. If a patient does have blockages to the arteries to the kidneys um, and that causes blood pressure problems that are resistant um, to medications, that can require potentially stenting. Now, if you look at the majority of patients that have high blood pressure, they have what's called essential hypertension. Probably 80 to 90% of people have essential hypertension, which just basically means as we get older, the arteries stiffen, sure. and as they stiffen, our blood pressure goes up. So it's the minority of patients that would have a blockage of an artery going to a kidney, but it's something the doctor may think about, especially in a younger patient where it requires more than three medications to control their blood pressure. Okay. You know what you just said, that kind of makes sense because my dad had, well, he had one of his kidneys taken out uh -huh. and then his other one and he had some blockages there too and he's uh -huh. always had high blood pressure. Uh -huh. So when you just mm -hmm. say that, if the kidney mm -hmm. wants more of the blockage, mm -hmm. I mean, that would make sense of his condition. Uh -huh. right. So interesting. So with all of that being said, um, how often should I see a cardiologist? What should I look for in a cardiologist? You know, mm -hmm. and you know, the type of relationship to form to help, you know, keep my health of my cardio. Well, system. I mean, I, I think like, do all patients need to see a cardiologist? You know, the answer would be no. Again, it would depend on risk factors, symptomatology. Um, now that being said, studies have shown patients who see cardiologists are less likely to have heart attacks and will live longer. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's a good thing. And that's one of the things that drove me to become a cardiologist that I think that we can have tremendous impact on the quality of life, mm -hmm. how long people live and how well they live. Standard, well, we'll say we had a patient who had had bypass surgery. Well, in a patient that's had bypass surgery, we tend to see those patients about every six months. We're wanting to check their cholesterol. If they're a diabetic, sure. their hemoglobin A1C. We want to make sure that they're exercising, watching their weight. So what we want to do is studies have shown by modifying their blood pressure, their cholesterol, their blood sugar, their exercising, losing weight, that's going to decrease the mm -hmm. likelihood of future events. Like also patients who have had stents. Well, those are like springs to open the artery. Well, we know they have blocked arteries and we don't want that to happen further because stents can also clot off. Um, they can start to get atherosclerosis or plaque buildup within them. But patients who exercise and lose weight and take their medications um, are much less likely to do so. So patients that have documented coronary disease, either bypass or stents, tend to see us about every six months where we're monitoring their cholesterol. Now, with any of these medications, we need to monitor blood work, like with the cholesterol-lowering medication, the statins, we follow liver function tests to make sure that those are okay. Um, certainly, I think if a patient is having shortness of breath, chest discomfort, losing consciousness, feeling like their heart's racing, that's something obviously discussed with your primary physician. 
And a lot of times the primary physicians are kind of the quote unquote gatekeeper to mm. send patients to us. Certainly we're always happy to have patients just come on their own without a sure. referral as well. Sure. Um, could you go into possibly the type of a exercise program? I know you mentioned it earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, an example of, let's say, during the week, the types of exercises I should do and, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like that for just people to get started on and, you know, to get going on. Okay. Well, again, I think you would have to make sure with your physician that you're appropriate to begin an exercise regimen. But that being said, we'll say that you're a good candidate for that. The eventual goal is a half an hour of cardiovascular exercise a day. So that's walking, riding a stationary bike or a regular bike, an elliptical, a stair climber, going outside and walking, running, swimming. Um, we want exercises that will improve our cardiovascular health and raise our heart rate. Studies have shown that the more times a day that your heart rate goes from baseline to that number that we talked about earlier and then down, the better. So we're not expecting, like if you have a patient that's not exercising, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Sure. Again, my goal for most patients would be walk two miles in a half an hour, one and a half to two miles. Now that being said, we may have patients that can run, but studies have shown walking quickly is as good as running. Mm -hmm. um, now, obviously if people are looking at weight loss, exercise and watching what we're eating, that combination is going to be good. Um, I am a big fan of the equipment like treadmills, stationary bikes, ellipticals, and stair climbers. And the reason is, you know, after the horrific winter that we had, there's mm -hmm. not a lot of time to spend outside and we right. don't want to go outside. So having equipment inside, it never rains inside, it's never snowy inside. Um, but you know, if we can put it in our living room or our basement next to the TV in a half an hour is just one show. Sure. You could do the half an hour continuously, or you could do 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the evening. People who exercise, their blood pressure will go down by seven to 10 points. Their blood sugar will go down. So if you wanna see a lot of your medications go away, exercise, weight loss is gonna be the key to that. Okay, excellent. Um, we're about ready to close. We have about a minute or so left. Is there any other closing you know, advice you have for people as far as being healthy? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, what I'm a strong proponent of is an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, I think, you know, I, the challenge to everyone out there is we cannot do anything about our genetics, but we can search, so, sure try to modify our behavior. Exercise, weight loss, not eating a lot of sodium, all of those types of things. Because, you know, certainly I don't want to see a patient with a heart attack. I would much rather, you know, see them at the mall, healthy, never having mm -hmm. to see us at all. Right. Um, and, um, you know, studies have definitely shown that our behavior very much can predict the future for us. Okay. Uh, Dr. Horth, I'd like to thank you for being on the show. This was most interesting, you know, about the cardiovascular system. Mm -hmm. um, that's pretty much our episode for this time for Quality of Life. I'm your host, Dave Augustine, and we look forward to talking to you next time. Thank you. <laughs>